Hello, everyone. As Liz said, I am Britt Berner, and I'm here to talk about some retirement planning issues after the SECURE Act. Um, the SECURE Act is actually called the Setting Every Community Up for Reti Retirement Enhancement Act of 2019. That's how they get SECURE. And this was an act that, among other things, changed how we're able to leave retirement accounts behind uh, when we die. So I want to talk specifically, um, I'm going to be talking about what we call qualified retirement accounts. So these are tax deferred plans like 401ks, 403bs, traditional IRAs, and the like. These are plans that you can think of as the ones that you save as when they tell you to save for retirement and you're putting away every month or every year into these plans. And then when you hit a certain age, the IRS says you must take what we call required minimum distributions. And that is based on your life expectancy. You can also on these plans take distributions before you're required to. However, traditionally it's been, and even with the change in the law, if you are younger than 59 and a half years old, there will be penalties on you taking this money out. This is all based on you and the government agreeing that you'll get tax deferred growth on those accounts if you decide and you agree to not take the money out of those accounts until after you're 59 and a half. The idea is you're saving for your own retirement and that's the purpose of this. Um, and what this CARE Act did is it changed some of those rules. Now, I wanna talk, the main thing that the SECURE Act changed was the payout for a beneficiary after the death of the original owner. But I wanna talk first about a few of the other things that changed as a result of this act. Um, so the SECURE Act, uh, some of these changes you'll see here up on your screen, there's now new rules. The idea is to make it easier and more efficient for business owners and specifically small business owners to set up plans for their employees. It also allows for part-time employees meeting certain requirements, which we're not going to get into right now, to also be able to contribute towards their retirement. The idea is to make it easier for smaller businesses and that more people can be contributing to their own retirement. Um, the other thing that changed is a continued ability to contribute to your IRA. So traditionally, once you hit 70 and a half, which was the age that you had to take those required minimum distributions, you could no longer after that age contribute to your account. Now with the new law, you can contribute after 70 and a half. You just have to prove that you have earned income. So either you're self-employed or you have a salary, you're being compensated for work that you're doing, you can continue to tribute, contribute. Um, and the required minimum distribution age has changed. So now instead of 70 and a half, it's 72 years old. So you can wait a little bit longer before taking those distributions. Another change is that 529 plans, the tuition savings plans um, that have tax benefits can now on a federal level can be used to repay qualified student loans for up to $10,000 a year. Now, it's very important to note that New York State does not, does not recognize this. So New York State is not going to give you or allow you to make penalty-free distributions out of that 529 or the repayment of a loan, but the federal government will. There's also a $5,000 penalty-free withdrawal when you're having or adopting a child. So you look at, say, someone who is um, someone who is 30 years old and they've contributed and they have a child or they're adopting a child for the one year after that child's date of birth or after the date of finalization of that adoption, the child, uh, the parent can get a $5,000 penalty free withdrawal from that, that account they were saving towards. It would usually have been a 10% penalty because they were below 59 and a half. Um, and uh, then the big one, and the one that we're really gonna focus time on today is that 10 year beneficiary payout. So I'm gonna talk now about what that means. So the 10 year payout. So let's first talk about what was it before 
right? What's, what's the difference going to be now? So it used to be that if you had what they call a designated beneficiary, so a qualified person usually, or certain trusts, depending on how the trust is drafted, named on the account as the beneficiary of that account, then upon your death, that beneficiary would be contacted by the institution and they would be given options as to how to take their distribution. They could take a five-year payout, meaning they would have to take it over the course of five years, or they could take what we call the stretch or roll it into an inherited IRA. That option would allow them, or traditionally allowed them, to take that distribution, those distributions over the course of their lifetime. So if you are a young person, if you're 30 years old and your parent dies and leaves you a retirement account, you would have what the IRS determined to be the balance of your life expectancy. It could be 50 years, 70 years, and that's how they divide up the plan. And so you continue to get tax deferred growth on that plan and it grows if you're only taking out those minimum distributions based on your life expectancy. The big change here is that those people now, except for certain exceptions we're gonna discuss, need to take a 10 year payout. Now realize that the problem there is that all of that money when distributed out of that account, whenever distributed, to whomever it's distributed, is taxable income because mom or dad, when they owned that account, didn't take distributions on it. They put that money in pre-tax, it sat there, it grew tax-free, and it was only when mom or dad took their required minimum distribution each year or whatever amount they chose to take, uh, it could have been could be more than required, but whatever that amount was they took out, that's all they were taxed on. So now if you have $100,000 that you now inherit and you need to take it over 10 years, that's going to increase your income that you have to report to the IRS. Important things to note. So for that 10-year payout, um, and I want to point out that a 10-year payout on the expectancy chart is similar to that of a 90-year-old person. So if you were 90 years old, you'd have to take a 10-year payout. And now they're saying that would be the same for a person of any age. You have to remove all of the money from the account by December 31st of the 10th year, the 10th tax year after that person died. Now, you can do it at any interval. So you could take it all in year one. You could take it all in year 10. You divide it by 10 and take it each year. You can take some the first year and none again until the 10th year. Any way you want to take it, you will take it. But be advised and realize that when you do withdraw that money, again, it is reported on your income tax returns as taxable income. And depending on what your bracket is, that will that your tax bracket that will determine how much tax you're paying. And depending on how big of a distribution you take, it will Likewise, determine maybe what bracket you're in, because if you're already on the higher end of a specific tax bracket, taking this extra distribution, giving yourself this extra income could be causing you to be in a higher bracket and therefore paying higher tax. So the most important thing, and if you leave here with nothing else today, is that it needs to be a thoughtful decision as to when to take those distributions and how to split it up. We're also gonna to get to some ideas about what the parent can do while they're still alive to perhaps defray some of those tax costs. So now we're gonna get into what the exceptions are. So there are five main exceptions for the account um, needing to be paid out over the course of 10 years. The five exempt beneficiaries from that 10-year payout is a spouse, a minor child, and it has to be the child of the original account owner. It cannot be a grandchild or, and it can't be another uh, beneficiary who's a minor. A disabled individual, now that does not require that it's a child or a descendant of the original owner. A chronically ill individual and an individual not more than 10 years younger. Um, so I'm going to get into a little bit about each one of these different things. 
Um, I see we have one question and I'm gonna jump in and take it now because I think it'll be, uh, makes most sense. Uh, the question is, so the inherited IRA must remain in a separate account for the 10 years, is that correct? So the, when the inherited IRA is, when the IRA is received and rolled over into that new account, it needs to stay in that account until the account is drained. So if you choose to only take a little each year or to leave it in there for the whole 10 years, yes, it remains in there. But at every time distributions are taken from that inherited account, there is a distribution that's made and that is a taxable distribution that is, is reported, as I said. So that is not a, um, it, it will remain in the account to the extent you don't use all the money in the account. Um, so to get into these five exempt beneficiaries. So one is the spouse. That is not a big change. If you leave your spouse as the name beneficiary on the account, not a problem, your spouse will receive it, they'll roll it over into a spousal uh, account and there's no issue. Now when your spouse subsequently dies, the person that they leave it to will be subject to these new rules. So they'll either get the 10 year payout if they're a named beneficiary, or they'll be one of these exempt beneficiaries. So second is a minor child. The interesting thing with this one is that the minor child gets to take the distributions on life expectancy until they turn the age of majority, until they're 18 years old. And then when they turn 18 years old, they then have to take the 10 year payout. So basically 18 to 28, and then the count has to be fully paid out. Um, the next is a disabled individual, and the statute actually says how they define that. Um, certainly somebody who's on Social Security disability who has qualified disabled under, under the Social Security Administration will fall in that category, as will others. Chronically ill individual, also something that is um, in the statute. And an individual not more than 10 years younger. Um, I think that's really interesting. It, it, to me, what it brings to mind are those who are leaving retirement accounts to their siblings or to a friend, um, any person that they are not married to, but they are choosing to leave this account to who's close in age. Um, and for these exempt beneficiaries, what the exemption does is it allows them to take it over their life expectancy. So that's the benefit of being one of these exempt beneficiaries, especially if you're a young exempt beneficiary, because your life expectancy is going to be longer, according to the IRS, than these the 10 year payout. Um, I think that an important thing to note right now is that in 2021, the IRS is coming out with a new life expectancy table. I, I believe the number is about, we're all expected to live about a year and a half longer now, or we are living a year and a half longer. And so the IRS is um, changing the charts to affect that. Um, and so that'll be coming in 2021, not quite yet. I see there's another question here um, about inheriting an IRA account and, and how old you have to be to start taking it. Um, and so I think what I, what I said before about the minor child is the interesting. So you have to, it always was that when you inherit an IRA, you have to start taking distributions the year after the deceased person dies, so regardless of your age, but the, the question is how much to take out, and that's what I just went through with these exempt beneficiaries. So um, I also want to point out that this also applies to Roth IRAs, and I know that Roth IRA contributions, you, you have been taxed on that money when you contribute, however, the growth is tax deferred, and so these same rules are going to apply when talking about Roth IRAs, even though that's not our, our main focus here. Another interesting thing to point out is what happens if you uh, have no named beneficiary or if on the beneficiary designation form, you either, so you either didn't fill it out or you put the estate of, you know, if it's my, my retirement account and I put the estate of Britt Burner, then what happens? Then it goes back to the rule that that always was, which is that it's a five year payout. And so 
you want to try and avoid doing that because you want to avoid the even shorter payout than the tenure for a designated beneficiary than the each person. So what can you do? And you know, a lot of this is, um, or all of this really, is, is person to person specific. In every case, we're looking at who is the IRA owner? How old are they? How large is their account? Um, what is the makeup of their family? Who are they leaving their assets to? Not just these assets, but other assets. Who are they choosing as their beneficiaries? Um, are they charitably inclined? Um, also, who are the beneficiaries? What tax bracket are they in? What is their need for, for money? What is their disabilities? What are, what are all of the things that go into determining the most tax efficient way to distribute these assets. Now, a lot of people are going to say, I have a spouse and I have children. And when I die, my spouse is going to want this and she may need it. And therefore I want it to be hers. And then upon her death, she's going to leave it to our children. And we don't want to do anything beyond planning because what's most important is that whoever needs the money my spouse, namely, that they have access to it when they need it. And that's a perfectly valid plan if you've looked at all this and realized that's the case. But for other people, they might want to be employing a little more creative uh, planning if it works for them. So some of the things you can do. So certainly if you're charitably inclined. Um, I have a client that we did estate planning um, in 2019 before this law came out. And you know, this was passed on December 20th. And we had done her planning and she wanted to leave a, a, she had a fairly large retirement account, but she had other assets as well. And she wanted to leave a fairly large um, chunk of money to a charity, a few hundred, a uh, few hundred thousand dollars to a charity that she really liked. Now, someone like that, it's worth the conversation that while the charity actually in her will is listed as a beneficiary and will receive the gift as part of her assets in total, probably the sale of her home, whatever it was. In her case, I would say, okay, well, let's look. If we leave this gift to charity out of your retirement account, well, then the charity is not going to be paying income tax on that. And it might be better than giving your children what you could see as a big, you know, taxable of gift. Um, we're not talking estate taxes here. We're talking income taxes. If I give somebody a $500,000 gift from my regular checking account, that is not of the same value as when I give somebody a $500,000 balanced retirement account. Because when they start withdrawing that retirement account, especially if they have to withdraw it within 10 years, they're going to have to pay quite a bit of tax on that. And so it's important to realize that it, we're not talking about the same amount of value when you're talking about a standard gift through will versus a retirement plan. So for your terribly inclined clients, you might wanna have a conversation. Is this something that you wanna do? Change around where the gifts come from. You may have a client who, who would wanna buy life insurance, um, but they, they don't know how to pay the premiums, they don't want to use their other income, their other um, money to pay the premiums. Well, maybe if they start drawing down a little more aggressively from their retirement plan while they are still uh, living, they will pay the taxes on that when it comes out, but they can use that money to pay a life insurance premium, which then is a gift which has a death benefit, which might be the same people who were gonna get that retirement account, but again, now you're not giving them a tax income taxable gift. Um, you certainly wanna look at if you have anybody who you plan to give to who falls into any of these exempt beneficiary situations. Do you have a disabled child, a disabled grandchild? Um, are there minors involved? Is there, um, you know, certainly if I had another client who we did planning for in 2019, who felt strongly that she wanted to leave assets to, to her, her siblings um, while her spouse was even still alive, if she was the first to go. And so plan, planning to give to them from the retirement account could be a great thing to do because they're less than 10 years younger than her. And so um, as long as they're underneath that 
that chart that says they'd have to take it in 10 years or less anyway, they could take it in more than 10 years. Um, I want to go back to talking about that, that life insurance that I talked about. You don't necessarily have to take those distributions and use them for life insurance. Um, if I have a client who has very minimal income, maybe they just have their social security, perhaps their security and a small pension, but they're in a fairly low tax bracket, but their child is in a higher tax bracket, they may choose to take higher distributions while they're alive because they'll pay less in tax than the child will. Um, and again, this is going to be very person specific and it's going to be based on how you want to be, uh, how much you want to prepare and how somebody wants to receive an asset. Another idea that I've thought about is if you were to have a spouse and children, if you have a larger retirement plan, um, you could leave as your initial beneficiary if your spouse doesn't need or want the whole account, or I should say need and want the whole account, you could leave part of it to your spouse and part of it to your children. That way your spouse can take it on their life expectancy. Your children will take a 10-year payout on the gift you give them. And then when your spouse dies, they'll get another 10-year payout on those assets, but it drew it out longer. And, and it, especially if there ends up being a lot of time in between the death of the two spouses, could minimize the taxes that the children have to pay. Um, I'm seeing some other questions that I'm going to go to. So um, how is the beneficiary's tax from an insurance policy different from an IRA? That's a great question. So if I am the named beneficiary on a retirement account that my mother leaves me, and I'm also the named beneficiary on a life insurance policy, then upon my mother's death, when I get that IRA, it gets rolled over and I have to take distributions within 10 years. Every dollar that I take out of that is considered income to me and I'm taxed on that as its income by the state and the federal government at my tax rate. So it's hard to say right now exactly what that is, but I'm taxed on that as income. Whereas if there was a $100,000 death benefit in the life insurance policy that my mother left to me, then at her death, I get that $100,000 and there is no tax on that. Now, if I choose to take that money and invest it and it grows, uh, it creates income and it grows, I'll pay, I'll pay taxes on the dividends and on the interest. But as long as, and again, I'm talking about income tax here. I'm not talking about the state taxes. I'll talk about that in a second. As long as it is uh, that death benefit, then I'm not taxed on every dollar like I would be when I take out of the in, uh, inherited IRA. Now, estate taxes are different. Whether I'm leaving someone a $500,000 retirement account or a $500,000 death benefit, if I haven't done any, any planning beyond this, that is part of what we call my taxable estate. And in New York State, as long as you have you die with less than $5.85 million, there are no estate taxes. The government, the federal government is currently $11.85 million exemption. So that's lifetime gifts and after death gifts. So as long as my mother's whole estate was less than those two numbers, then there's not going to be any tax on that life insurance policy when I receive it, the death benefit. And uh, there's a comment here as well that IRA distributions can be used to support long-term care premiums in addition to life insurance premiums. And that's certainly true. So again, we're going to look um, holistically at a person's situation and see what it is that they need, need or could use the income for. So there's a lot of different ways we can plan with this. Again, it's going to depend on the on how it works out for that person. Okay, and I think that someone had their hand raised. So if you have a question you would like to ask, there's a Q&A button on your uh, computer. So you can just click that and type in the question and we'd be happy to answer it. Okay. 
So the other thing I want to talk about is when a trust is a beneficiary of a retirement account. Um, without getting too in the weeds about this, um, I think it's really important to realize that not just any trust can be the beneficiary of a retirement account. And there are two main types of trusts that can be, but they have one of them specifically, what we call an accumulation trust, has tax complications with it and tax consequences. Now, like with anything else in life, we always have to balance the good and the bad. So while there are accumulation trusts, and what that means is if an accumulation trust, and it is accumulation by the way that it's drafted, it has certain provisions in it, and it says that when, when I die, I want my retirement account to be paid out to this trust for my child, let's say, and I've, it's been drafted as an accumulation trust, then when those distributions are taken from the retirement account, it accumulates within the trust, exactly as it's, as it's called. And so if it's $100,000 of retirement account, then the inherited IRA gets owned by that trust and the trustee decides how to take it over, over uh, time. But realize that when the, when the payout comes in, anything that accumulates in the trust is taxed at the trust's tax rate and trusts are automatically at the highest tax rate. So that's the downside. It's often a higher tax for that beneficiary for the assets not paid out. But on the other side, again, we always want to look at specific person situations and you want to look at, might there be a reason that I don't want that beneficiary to get all this money at once? Might there be a reason that I want a trustee to be able to manage how the money is paid out to that beneficiary? Do they have creditor problems? Do they have drug problems, alcohol problems, shopping spree problems? These are all reasons why you may want a trust to be in control of that money. There's not a right or wrong answer for how to do this. It all just depends on who your beneficiary is and if you understand what the pros and the cons are making the right choice in your situation. Another reason we often use a trust, if you take a second marriage situation, I may have a spouse that has different children than I have. So when I pass, I may want my retirement accounts to go to my spouse and my spouse can use them as they need them as they see fit. But then I want to ensure that upon my spouse's subsequent death, that those retirement accounts are paid out back to my children not to my spouse's children. I want to make sure that my family benefits in the end once my spouse is taken care of. By putting them into a trust, you can ensure that. So there's a lot of different reasons why you might plan differently. Again, the most important takeaway here is that there are options and that you just need to discuss them with your attorney, with your accountant, with your investment advisor, with your insurance advisor, and probably a conversation between, between those people to make sure that you're making the decisions that you want to be making. Um, Liz, I see there's some other questions. Do you wanna just ask them and I can, I can answer? Sure. Does the CARE Act apply to only IRAs? I have a TIAA CREF from my employer. Does the same 10-year payout re requirement apply? So I want to just be clear. We're talking about the SECURE Act, S-E-C-U-R-E, -E, not the CARES Act. That, that had to do with, with this COVID relief. So the SECURE Act um, is what we're referring to from December 19th. And uh, yes, it applies to all of these tax-deferred retirement accounts. It's going to apply, apply to your TIA CREF as well. Okay, next question. What is New York State taxable estate amount for a single person? Yeah, that's the $5.85 million. So if you die with less than $5.85 million in your name and assets, then there is no state tax on your on your estate. However, in New York State, we have what's called a cliff. So there's no tax, no tax, no tax. And then once you hit that 5.85, they say you fall off the cliff and you're taxed back from dollar one. 
So for people who are hovering uh, anywhere close to that 5.85 million, there is additional planning that we can do to make sure that the tax is minimized. I mean, I think, uh, you know, I, I've actually done a bit of research on, on this SECURE Act, and I was focusing a lot of what I was looking at on the 10-year payout, because that was the big news item, and that was really the thing that was going to be affecting most of our clients and most of the people I do planning for. Um, but when I was looking into it, I, I think really this, the interesting to me, most interesting to me was the $5,000 penalty-free withdrawal that you can take to defray the cost of having um, or adopting a child. And I think that that's a really nice benefit. Um, you know, sometimes I think we get a lot of bad in the news and we don't get the good. So I think that's a nice, um, that's a nice benefit for people. Yes. Okay, uh, just to be clear, if I pass and leave a $100,000 IRA to my 45 year old nephew, he has to take out in 10 years? Yes. And I will put back up my, my exemption, my exempt beneficiaries. But if your beneficiary doesn't fall into one of these five categories, spouse, minor child, disabled, chronically ill, or not more than 10 years younger, then yes, that individual will have to take it in the 10-year payout. I mean, it's interesting. I've gone to, to some CLEs on this as well. And, and what some of the experts say is, if the worst thing they have to do is pay taxes, you still gave them a gift, which is a pretty nice thing. So, um, you know, we, we like to keep that in mind. We like to be tax efficient and minimize things where we can, but it's still lovely uh, for your nephew that you gave him that, that gift. Okay, uh, do the same tax policies apply to pool income trusts? So the pool income trusts are gonna be totally different. Um, they're a totally different animal. I think the only way they really play in here is going to be if the pooled, if you do have a pooled income trust, that means you're receiving some type of government benefits for which you need to uh, shift your income every month in order to continue to qualify. And if you are a beneficiary of one of these accounts and you're receiving distributions, either as the original account owner or as a, you know, in, as an inherited and you're taking your payout, then you will need to count your distributions as income for your calculations for what goes into your pooled income trust every month. Um, so, so that's important to note. This does count as income. Retirement account distributions do count as income for the purpose of qualifying for government benefits. And so it will have to be shifted to the pooled trust as will your other income. Thank you. We have a few more questions. Current Roth conversions and charitable remainder trusts are additional planning options to the testamentary 10-year payment. So comments there. Yes, that's, you know, it's, it's funny um, that you bring that up. I, I was thinking about the charitable remainder trusts and I'm always uh, questioning whether or not how deep in the weeds to go on these things. Um, but yeah, charitable remainder trust is a really great idea. Again, for those for those beneficiaries that you have uh, who are charitably inclined because it can give the payout to an individual um, while they're alive and make sure they're taken care of, but then that charity inherits at the end and that's incredibly tax efficient. But um, you need to make sure that the client was charitably inclined to begin with in order to wanna do that kind of planning. Thank you. We've got one last question. Since there is no mandatory IRA withdrawal for 2020 and I made a partial withdrawal already, can I return the funds to an IRA? So I don't know if there's any specific um, information, and I think there might be some people on who will throw something out there, but I do know that when you take a withdrawal from an IRA, you have 60 days to return it, and there are no um, tax uh, ramifications to doing that. So if you have taken it within the last 60 days, you can certainly return it. Um, whether or not there's been an extension beyond that 60 days during this time of COVID and, and with these um, exceptions they're making, I, I actually don't know the answer to that. Um, but and I don't see anyone else popping up that, that they do either. But you certainly do have 60 days in any instance where you can return money that has been removed from a tax deferred retirement account. Hey, Britt, that looks like it for questions. Did you have anything else? 
No, I just uh, I just want to thank everybody for joining us. Um, and uh, you know, this again, I'm trying hard to not make it sound like I'm giving anybody legal advice. So I should have said my disclaimer at the beginning. But what I'm hoping that this did for most people is it just gave you a few ideas of, of conversations that you should be having with the professionals that you work with um, to see if there is other planning that can be done or that you need to do um, when it comes to your retirement accounts, given the fact that this law changed just in December. And, you know, a few days before Christmas, right around Hanukkah, so a lot of people didn't catch the change. Okay, uh, someone did chime in and said, RMD monies can be returned due to COVID-19 situation. Okay. They're not with attendee. So yeah, I would say, um, I, I'm certainly gonna Google it when we get off because I'm interested, um, but I'd say, yeah, let's take a look. It seems to be that that's the case. Thank you for, for that input. 